Let's be honest, the real controversy around the issue of guns is, what might we do about the problems guns present? It's the potential policy changes that make people squirrely. But changes have been made in the past, we can see what happened, and we can use that to inform what we might do in the future. That's the topic of this episode in this special series of Healthcare Triage. Deep breath, people. First thing we need to do is acknowledge that the solution to this problem is not a false choice between zero regulation and taking everyone's guns away. Other countries and individual U.S. states have adopted measures that we can consider. Let's wade in. In 2016, in the journal Epidemiologic Reviews, researchers published a systematic review of firearm legislation and its relationship to firearm-related injuries. They looked for studies both in the United States and abroad. They found 130 studies that met inclusion criteria. They found a couple of things that's worth talking about. For each, we're going to show you a pooled odds ratio diagram. We've discussed these before with respect to meta-analyses, but here's a review. A dot to the right of the vertical line is an increase in homicides, which is bad. And a dot to the left of the line is a decrease in homicides, which is good. Each line represents an individual study. Each dot's horizontal line is the confidence interval. And if that hits the vertical line, the study on its own wasn't statistically significant. First up are laws that restrict the purchase, access, and use of firearms. They were associated with reductions in firearm deaths. As you can see, most of the dots are to the left of the line. Overall, they found that these types of regulations seem to work to reduce deaths. The second is simultaneous implementation of laws targeting multiple elements of firearms regulation. These also were associated with reductions in firearm deaths, homicides, and suicides. Pretty much all of the dots are to the left of the vertical line. Third, they looked at relaxing firearms restrictions, such as stand your ground or concealed carry laws, and they found that these could increase the rate of firearm homicides, but the evidence is mixed. Let's look at the figure. Certainly relaxing laws doesn't appear to be good, though. As you can see from all of these plots, you can cherry pick among the individual studies. You can. You can find a study to show that some laws work, and you can find a study that shows that some laws don't. Moreover, some of these studies aren't from the United States, but from other countries. And as we've talked about in previous episodes, the United States looks like no other country with respect to guns, so there's some validity to questioning how laws in other countries might apply here. But still, we shouldn't ignore data and evidence. One study looked at gun restrictions in Colombia that reduced the number of days people could carry firearms. Homicides went down on those days. In Australia, a 1997 law placed restrictions on some firearms, mandated background checks, waiting periods, and safer firearm regulations. And it was associated with a 4.8% reduction in firearm homicide and a 9.9% reduction in firearm suicide in models adjusting for confounding factors like unemployment and alcohol consumption. In Brazil, Gun control reform was associated with reductions in firearm-related homicides and hospitalizations. In all fairness, though, there's mixed evidence from Canada. But let's talk about studies in the United States. It's hard to argue those aren't more on point. In 2012, a study in preventive medicine looked at how background checks are associated with firearm deaths. They created an additive index, which increased with each additional component of a background check, like criminal record, restraining orders, mental illnesses, misdemeanors, etc. They also had separate binary indicators for restraining orders, mental illness, misdemeanor, and fugitive status, relative to a baseline background check of only a criminal record. That's acknowledged that there are many potential confounders, particularly the efficiency and automation of background checks has a large impact on their effectiveness and was not considered. Still, more comprehensive background checks were associated with fewer firearm deaths. Another study, published in 2008, also looked at how increasing the information in background checks, which varies at the state level, influences firearm deaths. It used negative binomial regressions with controls for various factors impacting homicide rates like poverty, age, unemployment, etc. It found that local-level background checks, which can be much more detailed than federal ones, were associated with lower levels of firearm suicides and, to a lesser extent, homicides. This association held even when controlling for potentially confounding variables. In 2014, a study in the Journal of Urban Health examined Missouri's 2007 repeal of its permit to purchase handgun law, meaning that handgun purchasers no longer needed a valid license, which signified that they had passed a background check in the past 30 days to buy handguns. This change effectively eliminated background checks for handguns sold by unlicensed sellers 
rather than licensed dealers who are required to conduct a background check. The authors used t-tests to assess the significance of pre-repeal and post-repeal differences in mean age-adjusted homicide rates. That rate increased 25% in the post-repeal period, and the increase was not explained by changes in the national level or changes in bordering states. Further, the increase in homicide rates post-repeal occurred only for firearm homicides, Non-firearm homicide rates did not change significantly. The year after, in injury prevention, researchers studied how changes in firearm sales and dealer regulations were associated with illegal diversion of guns in California. California has enacted stricter gun control laws than most other states. For example, limits purchases to one handgun per month, enforces 10-day waiting periods before purchasing firearms, and does other things as well. They also have stricter background checks, and they prohibit sales to people convicted of violent misdemeanors, serve with domestic violence restraining orders, or admitted to emergency psychiatric evaluations. And these laws were associated with the oldest recovered crime guns relative to other states. This pattern held for guns originally purchased within the state of recovery and guns purchased in a state other than the recovery state. The takeaway is that effective enforcement of stricter gun control laws makes it more difficult for criminals to acquire new guns, since guns recovered in crimes in California were old relative to those recovered in other states. Moreover, the stringency of state firearms laws and regulations is associated with increased time to crime lengths for in-state and out-of-state guns recovered in analyses of all states, not just California. Even gun storage laws can have an effect. In 1997, researchers looked at relationships between safe storage laws and child mortality rates due to guns. They found that in states that implemented such laws, and there were 12 of them with such laws for at least a year between 1990 and 1994, unintentional shooting deaths in kids younger than 15 years old went down 23%. Another study in JAMA in 2004 showed that youth-focused firearms laws were associated with a modest reduction in suicide rates in youth between the ages of 14 and 17 years. I can quote studies all day, and I'd kind of like to, but the truth of the matter is that we don't have nearly enough data, but that could change soon. Just recently, using Thomson Reuters Westlaw data, Researchers created a database to record 133 different provisions of firearm laws in every state for the last 26 years. These provisions cover state policies on guns, ammo, who can have a gun, how they're stored, how they're sold, and how manufacturers can be held liable. The database is impressive. It will also allow for a number of analyses that haven't been done before. The initial analyses, published in the American Journal of Public Health just recently, showed that although the number of laws had nearly doubled over the study period, there's a ton of differences between states. We can use data like these to figure out what might work. What won't work is rhetoric, so we're not gonna do that. We're going to acknowledge that it's people who kill people. We're going to acknowledge that lots of things are associated with homicide and suicide beyond guns. We're going to acknowledge that bad things happen, including murder and suicide, even in places which have far, far fewer guns than we do. We're going to acknowledge that many people believe they have a right to own a gun. There are legitimate reasons to own guns. And that even when guns are kept out of people's hands legally, they can be obtained illegally. We're going to acknowledge that banning assault weapons wouldn't likely end mass shootings. We're going to acknowledge that the term assault weapons really doesn't mean what people think it means, and that mass shootings aren't really the biggest problem with guns anyway. But we at Healthcare Triage think it's important to acknowledge that there does appear to be a relationship between gun ownership and homicide and suicide. The system isn't working the way it should to keep guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them. This includes kids who are far too often the victims of both homicide and suicide. There are things we can do to improve the situation. We need to allow research to occur to inform those decisions better. Since this is a public good, we'd likely need to fund that work with public money. And we need to be able to work together to try and find solutions that both respect the rights of people to own guns while protecting Americans' lives as well. There is no one single answer, and it's not a false choice between all or none solutions. But we have to acknowledge that only by talking about this and trying to find solutions together can we both improve safety and public health while also respecting the rights of Americans. Healthcare Triage is funded in part by viewers like you through Patreon, a service that allows you to support the show through a monthly donation. Your support makes this show bigger and better. We'd especially like to thank Joe Sevitz and Sam. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Sam. More information can be found at patreon.com slash healthcaretriage. 